Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to this lecture. Just oh, these aren't my notes. Sorry. <laughs> um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Annabeth Lovies, who's a practicing physician in Newfoundland, and also I think with a subspecialty in rheumatology mm -hmm. as well. But I she came to my attention about two two and a half years ago. Uh, when I saw a research proposal that was circulated um, through the graduate committee and made some comments on it and found myself on the advisory panel for having done so. But it's been, <laughs> it's been a, an honor actually to be part of that. Um, I think the, uh, the, the research proposal to begin with was quite promising and uh, Annabeth has um, I think done exemplary work on it. In those two and a half years, in addition to completing the two um, research projects which form this thesis, she also found the time to get married, move house, and have a child. <laughs> uh, her dedication to work, her perseverance, and her efforts have been nothing short of remarkable. I'm extremely impressed, and so I'm delighted to introduce her uh, at this stage now, Annabeth. Thank you. All right, well, since these are my notes, I'll start with them. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to this lecture describing my thesis work. The title is, A Family Doctor Can Do That. Is there a role for a formalized referral network for office procedures in Newfoundland and Labrador? The reason why the title begins with a family doctor can do that is because it echoes both the surprise that a lot of patients have when they find out that their family physician can perform office procedures and as well it echoes the conviction that the family physician community could have in the performance of office procedures. Left, yes? First, a couple words of thanks, most importantly to my supervisors, Dr. Shad and State, for guiding me through this thesis journey and many teleconferences, and to Dr. Ryan for her help with my quantitative design and analysis, and to the family physician communities of Newfoundland and Labrador who gave up both their time and expertise to help me bring this research to life. The Department of Family Medicine Research Trust Fund provided financial support for the quantitative study. And last but certainly not least, to my family who have put up with what my stepsons call my homework for the last three years, and to my daughter who shared her mat leave with this thesis. <laughs> Before we discuss the studies completed as part of this thesis, I'd like to briefly talk about office procedures in family practice and the proposed idea of a formalized referral network. Office procedures are defined as diagnostic and therapeutic procedures that family physicians can provide to their patients in the office setting. Office procedures are an integral part of the skill set of well-rounded family physicians. However, there are both benefits and barriers to performing office procedures in family practice. These include access, wait times, time cost, financial cost, competence and frequency, and these are just to name a few. Despite the benefits, and as a result of some of these barriers, many office procedures that were once performed by family physicians have been assumed by specialists and other allied health professionals. Newfoundland and Labrador has a great need for skilled family physicians. 41% of the province's population lives in rural areas that are largely serviced by only family physicians. Only 3% of the province's specialists work in these areas. While it's important to increase the number of office procedures in family practice, it cannot be the responsibility of each individual physician. A solitary family physician cannot feasibly or practically perform every office procedure that their entire population might require. Even if they knew how to perform each procedure, had unlimited time and unlimited resources, the frequency with which they would perform each procedure may be so low that confidence and therefore competence may be affected. This is where the idea of a formalized referral network comes in. It has the potential to enhance the community of family physicians and improve patient care by improving access while minimizing costs and resources and allowing family physicians to focus only on certain office procedures while referring to colleagues for others. It may provide a consistent and structured way to refer and accept patients and may also increase awareness of who does what in the family practice community and how best to access these services. A formalized referral network, as envisioned as part of this thesis, will have two main roles. 
a clinical role of matching family physicians who do not perform an office procedure with a colleague who does, as well as an educational role with a capacity building function to target interested family physicians and provide effective learning opportunities for office procedures. The research question for this thesis is, is there a role for a formalized referral network for office procedures in family practices of Newfoundland and Labrador? This primary research aim is to explore the possible roles and feasibility of a formalized referral network. The research aims specific to the clinical role include describing the current pattern of performance of office procedures, identifying whether are there are potential participants interested in colleague referral, exploring barriers and benefits associated with current referral methods in order to effectively implement a formalized referral network and understand family physician expectations for colleague referral. Research aims sp specific to the educational role include identifying characteristics or predictors of family physicians and their practices that lead to increased performance of office procedures in an effort to focus on or target individuals or in specific populations for educational activities and to determine in which learning environments skills and confidence are acquired in order to provide the most effective learning opportunities. A mixed methods approach using a sequential explanatory design was chosen to answer this research question. The initial study was a descriptive quantitative study consisting of a self-administered survey followed by a qualitative study using four semi-structured focus groups. The quantitative data from the initial study was used to shape the questions presented to and discussed as part of the focus groups. Following individual analysis of each study, the findings were synthesized and interpreted as a whole. The initial quantitative study was entitled, Quantifying the Performance and Predictors of Office Procedures in Family Practices of Newfoundland and Labrador. 597 self-administered surveys were mailed to each family physician registered with the College of Family Physicians and Surgeons of Newfoundland and Labrador. Filtering the total responses for exclusion criteria and missing data, the eligible survey response rate was just over 22%. That is 132 family physicians. For the purposes of the quantitative study, we narrowed the definition of office procedures to include only elective, office-based procedures that are considered part of the core skills for family medicine resident training according to the CFPC 65 core procedures. Newfoundland and Labrador has several health care initiatives which impact the performance of office procedures in primary care and as a result only procedures that were not addressed by these initiatives are included. As a result of the application of these filters, the list of 65 office procedures was reduced to 12. The 12 procedures, shown right there, belong to four categories, which are based on the specialty to which a family physician may refer, including dermatology, gynecology, surgery, and orthopedic surgery. The next four slides will discuss the findings related to the four research questions posed as part of the quantitative study. What are the patterns of office procedure performance? All but one respondent reported seeing patients who require office procedures. And of that group, 94.7 reported performing at least one of the 12 office procedures. And of this group, the mean number of office procedures performed by each respondent was 6.9 out of the 12 procedures. This group had a mean frequency of performance of each procedure which varied between 0.3 and 4.5 times per month depending upon the procedure. I was surprised and delighted to discover that there are so many family physicians performing office procedures in Newfoundland and Labrador. However, there was still a clear discrepancy noted between the number of each office procedure that was performed and the number of each office procedure for which patients required. What are the predictors of office procedure performance? There were eight predictors that were studied as part of this study, and each of them was associated with increased performance in at least one category of office procedure. However, no one predictor was associated with increased performance in every category. 
Listed here are only the statistically significant associations and not some trends that were also noted. Male physicians are more likely to perform orthopedic procedures, while their female counterparts were more likely to perform gynecologic procedures. <laughs> Younger physicians and those with fewer years in practice were more likely to perform orthopedic procedures. Family physicians in group practices that provide cross coverage were more likely to perform dermatologic procedures than their solo practice colleagues. Non-urban physicians were more likely to perform dermatologic procedures. Family physicians who were involved in teaching medical learners were more likely to perform dermatologic, gynecologic, and surgical procedures. And having a Canadian residency was associated with performing more orthopedic procedures. What learning environments influence office procedures? The three learning environments reported as being most commonly used to acquire office procedure skills were medical school and residency, continuing medical education, and self-learning. The survey asked respondents first to select the learning environments that they had used to acquire office procedure skills, and then to select the one learning environment that provided the most confidence in performing office procedures. For example, 89.4% reported acquiring office procedure skills in medical school and residency. However, only 59.3% of that group reported that it provided them with the most confidence in performing office procedures. So in conclusion for this slide, commonly used learning environments are not always associated with high levels of confidence. Do family physicians believe that there is potential for colleague referral for office procedures? This research question aims to identify whether there are potential participants interested in colleague referral within the family practice community. There appears to already be an informal network of colleague referral for office procedures in the family practice community, as 42.4% of the respondents reported already referring their patients to colleagues. Family physicians in group practices that provide cross coverage were more likely to be already involved in office, in office procedure colleague referral. However, while 42.2% already referred to colleagues, 90.2% said that they would if given the opportunity. Female gender, an urban practice location, and a Canadian residency program were characteristics all associated with a greater likelihood of potential colleague referral. But it's not enough to know that there are family physicians willing to refer their colleagues for office procedures that they do not perform themselves. There must also be family physicians who perform office procedures that are willing to accept patients from colleagues. 78.4% of respondents who reported performing office procedures reported a willingness to accept referrals from colleagues. Understandably, family physicians who have access to hospital resources were more likely to be willing to accept colleague referrals. The second study was entitled, How do Newfoundland and Labrador Family Physicians Perceive Colleague Referral for Office Procedures? This was a descriptive qualitative study design. Participants were recruited, through the were recruited through the survey packages mailed as part of the initial quantitative study, where family physicians were invited to submit their contact information. The findings of the previous study were used to develop a semi-structured focus group guide, which was then used to conduct the focus groups in four geographic locations reflecting a variety of practice settings and hospital access. These included urban, rural, and academic-based office practices, as well as rural and semi-urban communities with both partial and full hospital-based practices. The focus group participants perceived the concept of a formalized referral network between family physician colleagues as having the potential to improve medical practice for both themselves and their patients. Five overarching themes were identified as having important implications in the potential development of a formalized referral network. Deciding to perform office procedures in family practice is essential to colleague referral. Numerous internal and external influences shape the decisions, including patient need, physician enjoyment, lack of adequate remuneration, limited time, and limited physician comfort. Providing support for office procedures and family practice from outside of the family practice community, including specialists, 
uh, training programs and health authorities influence both performance and participation in colleague referral. These influences include learning opportunities, relationships with specialists, frequency and competency, as well as financial support. Changing patient experiences with family physician referral. Participants reflected on the impact of colleague referral on their patients, improving, Im improving access, reduced wait times, and less required travel. There were varied thoughts about the expectations of patients if a family physician colleague, rather than their own family doctor, were to perform their procedure. Is the trust in a family physician and patient relationship transferable to another family physician colleague? Ultimately, participants reflected that this is an individual decision and that it was best to both educate patients and give them the option of colleague referral. Oh, sorry, I have to go back. All focus groups agreed that sharing expertise in family practice is and would be beneficial. They discussed some of the mechanics and practicalities of colleague referral, including setting clear expectations for the referral process, appropriately managing follow-up, clarifying medical and legal responsibilities, and the importance of maintaining a family practice balance in which they are not simply the physician who does X procedure all day, every day. Focus group participants discussed the organization of office procedure referral and how they envisioned a formalized referral network operating and being implemented. While all participants agreed that a formalized referral network is a good idea, they varied in their thoughts on how best to organize and implement it. The synthesis of the two studies concluded that the proposed clinical and educational roles of a formalized referral network were indeed supported by the findings of these studies. This slide is a little busy, but I'll explain. This slide outlines how the two studies, quantitative and qualitative, <coughs> combine to deepen our understanding of the potential clinical and educational roles for a formalized referral network. In understanding the potential for a clinical role, both the demand for office procedures in family practice and the interest in colleague referral were explored by both studies, with the quantitative study providing description of patterns, performance and interest, and the qualitative study confirming these findings and exploring them at a deeper level. An understanding of the educational role, the quantitative study identified that specific predictors were associated with different subsets, but no one predictor was associated with increased performance of all office procedures. And the qualitative study both affirmed some of these findings and identified additional considerations for identifying family physicians who may be interested in office procedures. Effective learning environments were explored in the context of use and confidence in the quant quantitative study and examined in the context of confidence and support in the qualitative study. Interpreting and synthesizing these findings led to reflections on a re formalized referral network for office procedures in family practice by identifying four main roles. A formalized referral network ultimately relies on family physicians performing office procedures in their practices, and therefore one of the roles of a formalized referral network must be to encourage performance. A formalized referral network must not only rely on the fact that family physicians know how and perform office procedures in practice, it must connect colleagues through referral processes to address discrepancies between the demand for and performance of office procedures by addressing needs not already addressed through informal referral methods and connecting family physicians who are both willing to refer and willing to accept patients. Oh, sorry. A formalized referral network needs to look at current issues and barriers with office procedures from both a family physician, specialist, patient, and health authority perspective and strive to improve upon them. And finally, a formalized referral network should be effectively implemented to address family physician concerns including the distribution of information, remuneration, expectations of patients and colleagues, and awareness campaigns. The findings of this study, completed as part of this mixed methods design, are an essential and important first step in identifying the role for a formalized referral network, but there is still much more work to be done. 
additional research focusing on the thoughts and expectations of other populations, including patients, specialists, and healthcare authorities, and the impact of colleague referral upon these groups must be completed. An important next step would be a small-scale pilot formalized referral network in a trial location with pre- and post-implementation studies to examine the patterns of performance, wait lists, and the financial impact of this formalized referral network. Other considerations include social network analysis as well as further research into some of the items identified as part of this thesis but not fully explored with this thesis scope of work. This final slide outlines recommendations for advocacy that were identified throughout the research and should be considered as part of and in conjunction with the proposal of a formalized referral network. To advocate for colleague referral through a formalized referral network to governing bodies. To promote the performance of office procedures to family physicians through educational and awareness campaigns. To propose the establishment of a family practice referral billing code to help offset costs of resources and time spent by family physicians willing to do office procedures for colleagues' patients. To provide reference material, clarifying guidelines, and potential pitfalls surrounding office procedures through consolidation with the College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Canadian Malpractice Association and to advocate and explore options to increase access to resources through both financial compensation, shared information about where to best access, and increased access to hospital resources. This brings us to the end of today's lecture. I'd like to thank you all for coming to learn about the work that I've been doing for the last three years. And are there any questions? Yes. I'm wondering if you can comment on the area where the physicians identified where they started to learn about the procedures. Right. It didn't always correlate with a feeling of confidence. So can you expand on that discrepancy there? Like, so in other words, why some people are choosing to do it and why a bunch of others didn't? An interesting finding that came up when we did that was we put a category of other after our initial five, what we thought to be the most common learning environments. And I was surprised to find that there weren't common learning environments associated with high levels of confidence. However, in the other department, there were several people who had written almost essays on the side of the survey saying, I did shadowing with such and such a physician and found it was wonderful experience. We qualified that more during the qualitative data, and I asked uh, participants who were in the focus groups how they felt they could be best supported in the confidence in office procedures and there was a resounding response that they need to have specialist backup and specialist liaisons to support them in their study of office procedures not specifically with acquiring skills but with continuing to have the confidence to perform them well into practice especially when associated with low frequency Yes, Chief. And Beth, can you speak more about, you touched on it, but, but the, the patient-doctor relationship, and you talked about, you know, can you transfer that to your colleague for that referral, for that one procedure? And I guess the other question that goes with that is, does it really matter? True. We it's talked... Coming from my mouth. <laughs> we talked about that fairly extensively in two of the four focus groups and touched on it in all four. But in the two groups where we spoke about it, we talked about the term specialist and the fact that it starts with the word special. Mm -hmm. And did that mean that w sending to a specialist made, meant that we made this patient a higher priority because we, we were sending them to someone special in what they do as opposed to sending them to another family physician just like you? So we made that sort of terminology issue. But aside from that, there were questions about wait times. Because you may think that referring to a family physician, if you can get them in within a week or four weeks, you may do that because you're more worried about your patient and you want them seen quickly, as opposed to waiting six to 18 months to see the specialist. But it's hard to educate patients and it'll be very important to say to them, 
the difference in going to a specialist versus going to a competent family medicine colleague who is very skilled at doing this procedure and does it all the time is negligible. The other half of that coin that we discussed is that a lot of specialists, especially in Newfoundland and Labrador, work with massive teaching teams. So when you see the specialist, odds are the person who's doing your simple office procedure is not the specialist. It's the clerk or the intern or the resident, and you may not even lay eyes on the specialist the whole time you're there for something simple as, say, a joint injection in orthopedics or a punch biopsy for dermatology. That's not what the specialists are doing. But it's hard to educate patients who are used to this norm of if you go to your family doctor and they don't do what you need done, you send to a specialist. So there will be some educational and awareness issues when it comes to patients to get them to build that trust in other family physicians in the same way that they have it with the specialist community. Yes. Thank you very much for that, Annabelle. Very nicely done. Thank you. Um, it's easy for um, when someone is doing a procedure, particularly one of the ones on the list that's less commonly done, mm -hmm. it's easy for a family physician who's doing this to get a lot of referrals built up over time. And then, as you indicated in your study, uh, there's a tendency for them to become too much, too mm -hmm. focused on that. And, uh, so do you have any thoughts about how a formalized referral network might deal with that issue? Are there things about having a formalized network that might help with that? We talked about having a structured element to the formalized referral network. Largely, it would result in organizational skills. So if you were to refer to a colleague, you would need to know how many procedures that colleague wanted to do a week. So we spoke to the idea of having blocks of clinical time or having access to a minor OR in the hospital setting for a certain amount of time per week. That way you wouldn't lose the general practice feel of family practice, but for a certain time period that you would delegate, you would do procedures for both your own patients and colleagues. That would kind of keep you with both hands in the pot. You would do lots of procedures and have a good frequency, but at the same time you wouldn't be doing them 24-7. And I've done that in my practice. Uh, Stephen mentioned my rheumatology practice. I only take new rheumatology assessments on Tuesday mornings. And I block half hours for them, and I do six every week. I don't do any more. And if they have to wait a month to see me, so be it. But if I start doing more than that, I start to lose what I love about family practice, which is doing everything. And I do 10 of the 12 procedures here. And I'm in a group of eight physicians, and they often refer to me, because I'm the arts and crafts girl is what they call me, because I do all the hands-on stuff. But I don't mind, because it's a nice variety, and it's a good assortment of things to do, and I like the way that that breaks up my week. I like knowing that going in on a Tuesday morning means I'm going to just be doing rheumatology that morning and I don't have to fit that into the rest of my week. And even in the focus groups, without me bringing my element to it, this came up over and over. How do you separate the office procedures that are staff intensive, time intensive, cost intensive, equipment intensive, from your day to day practice? How do you set up for an endoscopy when next door you have someone who wants to see you for depression. It's difficult. So blocking off time was one of the options that came up when we were talking about this in the focus groups. Yes? Can you comment more on the resource issue? How big of a barrier was that for a lot of the family physicians that they, uh, you know, just didn't want to have the equipment or the sterilization or you know, uh, all the stuff associated with doing something very simple and something a little bit more complex. And that was a that, seemed to factor into it. that was a massive issue that came up again and again, both in performing office procedures for your own patients as well as accepting referrals from colleagues. It was interesting because I tried to have as varied a sample as I could in the focus groups by geographically isolating my groups. So the first group was a mix 
with academic family physicians and community family physicians in an urban environment. And there was a very clear discrepancy between the resources that the academic family physicians had access to versus those in the community practice who had no access to hospital resources at all, bought their own autoclaves, bought everything that they needed to get. It was. There were moments when I thought there was going to be fights in the middle of the focus group as so-and-so didn't have to pay for theirs and so-and-so did have to pay for theirs. And it kept coming up again and again. One focus group was entirely hospital-based. All of their family practices were inside a hospital setting. Resources hardly came up in that group, except to say, I'm sure there are other doctors who find that it's very difficult to get resources, is what they would say. And then there's another group, which is a rural community that doesn't have its own hospital of any variety. It's just a clinic base where they pay for everything. And they were very frustrated with the cost of an endometrial biopsy is $400 for a box of 40. And that's a lot of money when you're talking about doing a procedure. And it's very cost prohibitive. We worked out the cost with one of the groups that were very money-centered, and it was actually $5 more expensive to perform the procedure than what they were being paid in their fee-for-service salary for doing the procedure. So it's very hard to convince people to not only do procedures for their own patients, but to do them for a colleagues' patients when they're actually going to lose money on the procedure. So resources have become a major issue. And there are several ways of going about it. Some of the academic family physicians said, well, just come to us, and we're happy to have you. And if you do, if you do performance of office procedures, you can train our residents. You can come into our facility, use our supplies, and we'll, we're happy to have you. And then other physicians said, well, that'll disrupt the flow of my clinic week. And there were all kinds of back and forths about it. The two main things that came up was the idea of having this referral billing code, that if you were to see another family physician's patient for an office procedure, you would get a blanket <coughs> amount that you would bill in your fee-for-service agreement for that code to help offset your cost of, and time. This wouldn't help with your own patients, but at least it would help stimulate the performance. In addition to that, we talked about the idea of having access to hospital resources through minor OR time or having hospitals distribute sterilized packs, sterilized things, autoclaving dirty instruments and bringing them back clean were another option that was brought forward. That came up several times as we went through.